My name is Julia Smith, and I'm the Vice President of the Small Scale Meat Producers Association. And I'm joining you today from the traditional homeland territories of the Anshakapmak and Sealock Nations in Merritt, British Columbia. I know that we are being joined today by people from across the province and traditional homelands and unceded territories of many Indigenous peoples. Food production is tied intimately to the land and to acknowledge it, we must recognize its longer history and our place in that history. The land that sustains us was and is made richer by the people who lived and continue to live in our respective regions, whose practices and spiritualities were and are tied to the land and the water. The Small Scale Meat Producers Association recognizes the importance of continuing to build our relationships with all Indigenous peoples wherever we might reside. I am thrilled to be sharing the results of our 2021 survey of small scale meat producers with you today. In fact, this is the first thing we intended to do when we first incorporated as a society in early 2018. Unfortunately, this project got shelved quickly in the onslaught of consultations and other pressing issues, so we were very happy to be able to finally take this on last year, thanks to funding part by Agriculture and Agri-Foods Canada and the Government of British Columbia through programs delivered by the Investment Agriculture Foundation of BC. We had an incredible team headed up by Director Corinne Singfield, we brought Abba Reeve on as project coordinator and her input and support was invaluable. Morgan Ursel pitched in as research assistant while Michelle Schaefer and Raquel Koloff managed a team of 12 hardworking and resourceful regional representatives who were absolutely key to the success of this project. We are very excited and proud of this work and believe it will be a useful tool in helping our industry grow. Please post questions in the chat as we go along, as we will have some time for questions at the end of the presentation. Presenting our findings today is our team lead, Corinne Singfield. Corinne is an agrologist and farmer. She lives in Bella Coola, where she operates a mixed farm raising heritage pigs. She has almost 20 years of experience working as a farm and project manager. Previously, she worked as a research associate and lead on-farm instructor for Kwantlen Polytechnic University. She currently works as a regenerative agriculture consultant and researcher and serves on the board of directors for the Small Scale Meat Producers Association. Over to you, Corinne. Thank you very much. Julia was saying early on in the development of SSMPA, it was very obvious that not much was known about small scale meat producers in BC. So by conducting this survey, we aim to answer a few questions about our sector, such as uh, who are these producers? Uh, where are they located? What are their practices? Where do they sell their products? Who do they sell their products to? What animals do they raise? What land base do they occupy? And so on and so forth. So in this presentation, um, we will be presenting uh, an overview of our results. Um, obviously, no one wants to attend a five-year webinar, a five-a uh, five-hour webinar. Uh, so we're only here for an hour, and we want to hear from you. So uh, in the discussion at the end, um, so we will go into an overview. But I encourage you to read the full report when it's ready very soon. Um, if you're interested in uh, learning more about what we found out. So before we dive in. Um, I want to talk a little bit about our methodology. So we started the uh, survey project with the assumption that our targeted audience, the small scale meat producers, were tired of surveys uh, or completely lacked trust in the consultation process. Um, so, you know, there had been lots of survey, lots of surveys, lots of consultation about meat issues, about uh, rural environments, about COVID. Um, and so we knew that if we just sent our survey into the world, it might not get the great response that we wanted to have. Um, so we knew we needed people on the ground who have the trust of the communities. Uh, we needed to involve producers from the beginning. So basically when we designed the survey, uh, we had a group of 20 producers across the province uh, that helped to shape the questions. Um, and then we 
hired two regional rep coordinators, one for the South and one for the North. Um, and these regional reps started making phone calls using all of their extended networks. And we ended up finding uh, regional coordinators for all of the 27 regional districts um, in the South and in the North. Um, we were uh, we held uh, meetings with these regional um, uh, coordinators um, almost weekly during the time that we were uh, conducting the survey, and and these went uh, used all the methods possible to reach the producers that were hard to reach. So uh, you know, farm, direct farm visits, uh, local media, farm stores, farmers institute, word of mouth, agricultural societies, um, and so we ended up. This is how we ended up reaching producers. Um, and unfortunately, halfway through our survey effort, um, uh, we were hit with record-breaking fire season. Um, and our regional representative said that they could no longer reach producers. Um, so we extended the deadline a little bit um, and got a little bit more um, uh, responses that way. Um, so survey results, uh, no review. Um, we ended up getting 708 responses to the survey, 708 uh, operations. So basically we asked for one response per operation um, from uh, an owner and op or operator uh, from uh, that operation, answering for uh, the entire staff and personnel of that operation. So 708 operations. Um, 89 of which were uh, previous producers, because we also, there was two surveys. There was the first question being, are you currently a producer? Or are you no longer a producer? Uh, and we wanted to hear as well from producers that had left the business um, um, in, in the past five years uh, to know what kind of challenges they experienced and why they left the business. So this map here shows uh, the different percentages of where all of the different uh, respondents were. And it also shows that we had respondents from all 27 regional districts. And these regions are the um, agricultural uh, uh, regions of BC. So that's um, a denomination from the ministry. Um, in terms of demographic, um, we had 48% um, um, female, 51% male respondent, 29% um, were under 40, while the majority were uh, between 40 and 65 years old. Um, and very interestingly here, 96% um, uh, said that they supplemented their income with work not related to their main business. So this is really enormous and is very consistent across the provinces. Um, and 32% uh, were doing other types of farming, agritourism, 7%, off-farm employment, 63%, which is very, very high. Um, and 47% uh, were self-employed. And as you can see, these percentages don't add up because a lot of people are wearing many hats and they're doing many different things. Um, and then within that group, uh, we also asked it, how many were striving to be full-time producers and 29% said, said that they would in fact like to uh, turn this into a full-time occupation. Uh, we also looked into the years of operation um, and um, 63% of the respondents reported running their meat businesses for less than 10 years. 40% um, uh, were new entrants, so as defined as being in the business for five years or less. 65% um, of the new group producers quit after less than 10 years in business. Um, a third of these were from the South Coast, uh, and they reported ending their operations after less than five years. Um, small scale meat producers um, are raising a very wide varieties of species, um, more than 15 in fact. Um, and you can see here from this table uh, that there's a, a wide range of scale as well. So uh, if you look beside cattle, 
um, what this table tells you is that 47% of the operations that responded are raising cattle. Uh, and the maximum amount of cattle head reported was 3,000, and the minimum is one. So in the um, comments, there, there are places to leave comments in the survey. A lot were saying that the low numbers were explained by several reasons. Uh, one being just getting started or uh, scaling down because uh, of challenges or, uh, you know, getting into it. There are many, there's various reasons. Um, the other interesting thing that we found is that uh, these farms are very diversified. Um, there's, there's, there was 43% that were raising only one livestock type on their farm, but 57% were raising two or more. Uh, and another an additional 32% do other types of farming. So these are very, very diversified farms that we're talking about. Um, this table um, discusses, describes the acreage used by these producers. Um, it does not detail the number of individual operations that have those land arrangements. Uh, you can consult the final report to go more in depth in, into that topic, but there's a few things of interest here, uh, outliers in this table. Um, like for example, in the Thompson Nicola Valley, We've got 49% of the total land mass that is used uh, for animal production in the Thompson Nicola Valley is, is uh, First Nation land. Um, and this is split amongst only 3% of the respondent. Um, and then we've got uh, the high percentages of rented or leased land in Caribou, Chilcotin, Kootenai, and Okanagan, and the relative small amount of, of leased land in Omnica Skina piece where um, an overwhelming majority of the producers are owning their own land, for example. Um, and then of interest is also the high percentages of other land arrangements um, in uh, Caribou Cotton and the Vancouver Island. So other land arrangement can be things like land matching or succession. Um, there's, here is another slide that um, offers another way of visualizing the land that these farmers are occupying. Um, the, the big square represents the average uh, land that these farmers are, are utilizing. And the, the small square is the median. Um, so when there's a big difference, uh, that means that we, we have a mix of very large farms and very small farms, like for example, in the peas. Um, and when the differences are very small, like you can see those squares in the South Coast, that's 21 uh, acres in average and set and five um, as a median. So, so these are more, definitely more homogeneous small farms. Um, and then we also have on the right, the number of operations with grazing tenures. Um, and we thought this was really interesting, figure out how many um, small scale identifying uh, ranchers um, have grazing tenures. Um, so in the Caribou Cotton Coast and Thompson Nicola, uh, that, you know, which are two areas that have a lot of cattle, not surprised, doesn't come as a surprise that there's obviously more of these operations with grazing tenures. Um, small scale producers um, almost all have uh, operations that utilize a lot of outdoor um, uh, management. Um, and so we asked if they were using uh, some um, beneficial land management practices uh, from the list. These were the top choices uh, among the choices that we offered. Um, and we also found out that producers use an average of three of these practices. Um, so we've got, for example, 43% are using multiple species grazing, intensive grazing, regenerative agriculture. Um, so it's really interesting to, uh, um, to, to learn about um, you know, things that we've known, so we've known for a long time that these operations are using a lot of uh, ecological and beneficial practices. Um, 
And then to learn a little bit more about their operations, we also asked if they were certified by third parties. Um, and so we had 22 farms, for example, that were, ver that were um, certified by verified beef production. Um, and interestingly, uh, that consists of 22% of all verified beef production ranches in BC. There was also, for example, 18 certified organic operations. Um, as you can see here, 98% um, uh, sell direct to consumer. Um, so this is really, really big. Um, actually, when we look at defining who small scale producers were, uh, selling direct to consumer was definitely a characteristic. Uh, they rely heavily on word of mouth and social media. Um, many expressed through the survey that they either had sufficient customer base or could not meet the current demand that they experienced due to other challenges, not allowing them to, to produce at the desired scale. Um, and then we also asked them where they sell their product. Um, so direct consumers, farmers market, restaurants, others, butcher shop, grocery stores. Um, we, um, we ask a lot of questions um, about the challenges. Um, so like I said, we'll just go into an overview here, but there's a lot of interesting, um, a lot of interesting things about the challenges, definitely. Um, but it, but we uh, the 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 table on the right um, details basically we ask the producers to select the challenges that apply to their operations and to rank them uh, from one to uh, seventeen. One being uh, the biggest challenge. Uh, so you can see here that across all of the the regions, access to slaughter was definitely the number one. Um, the number one challenge. Uh, access to cut and wrap was number two almost everywhere. And profitability was number three almost everywhere. Uh, another thing that is interesting to note is that uh, demand was, was very low uh, uh, across all of the regions. Um, uh, we had a lot of comments that there was a lot of demand for the products and actually that uh, that producers felt that they could not meet uh, the demand for their products due to other challenges. Um, farm insurance uh, was a recurring thing uh, that people were mentioning. It's, uh, it, it ranked um, uh, five or six um, across all regions in terms of, of uh, challenges. Um, and, and then we also asked producers uh, for what aspects of their farm they were carrying insurance. Um, and only 60% had general farm liability insurance. Um, uh, and only 50% of all of the uh, uh, operations that had a sl on-farm slaughter license uh, had slaughter liability. Um, so we've also heard a lot of feedbacks from, from producers that it's very hard to find insurance uh, there's not a lot of insurers that want to touch small farms and let alone uh, livestock operations. Um, we also inquired about uh, profitability. Um, and um, uh, we, in the profitability rankings here, we only had 1% that said that they were the um, high, high profit for the operation. Um, and moderate profit was 10%, operating at a loss was 37%, break even 26%, and low profit was 26%. Um, so this is, this, is, uh, this is a pretty serious um, aspect of the business. We cannot expect these farms to continue operating if uh, they are not making a living. Um, out of it. So this is why, um, you know, a little bit earlier, we, we discussed um, that 96% of these operations were uh, keep, had off-farm jobs. Um, and, you know, we keep hearing things like, oh, I, I, I'm keeping my job to be able to finance my farming addiction. Um, and, and this is definitely a big issue. Um, so 
the farm, after asking about the profitability ranking, we also asked uh, the producers to um, uh, rank factors that would help their farm um, uh, um, have an increase in financial sustainability. Financial sustainability uh, as defined as uh, paying yourself and your employees a living wage after paying for all your expenses. Um, so lower feed costs uh, came on top. Uh, increased availability of slaughter services was second. Uh, improved availability on on-farm slaughter was third. And then we had increased access to cut and wrap and increasing production. So since the survey, uh, there have been at least two of these factors uh, that have found some level of resolution. So ability to have additional housing uh, in December uh, 2021, uh, the, the uh, announcement uh, that second residents were to be allowed on ALR was a, was a really big thing for farmers definitely across the province. And then the approved improvability of on-farm slaughter uh, in October 2021, the new on-farm slaughter regulations um, that came in. Um, uh, there's also uh, some factors that have gotten worse, like lower feed costs. We know that uh, feed costs have increased tremendously in the past year, and um, the, the, there's no, uh, there's no, um, there, it's not slowing down the increases. So it's uh, it's it's getting worse and worse, and with the prices of fuel. Uh, getting higher, it's probably going to get worse even uh, more this year. So, um, we asked since slaughter issue came on top in all of the provinces, um, we asked uh, we asked the producers where they got their animals slaughtered, um, and the majority, I would say, said that provincially inspected abattoirs. Um, and then the other choice was unlicensed on farm. Uh, this was quite a surprise. Um, uh, throughout the province, there was 35% uh, that practice unlicensed on farm slaughter, um, and 12% go through someone else's D license. Um, and then asked if uh, there was 109 operations that practice unlicensed slaughter only. Um, and there was 53% of these uh, operations that said that they would be interested in getting um, an on-farm slaughter license uh, if it became available in their area. Um, and if we talked about uh, the the rest of of the the rest of the operation, so every operation, including those that use provincially inspected abattoir. Uh, it was 39%. So 39% of all operations that answered the survey uh, would be interested in considering uh, getting a slaughter license. Um, so just for reference, uh, for those who are not fully familiar with the new slaughter licenses, um, uh, this, this diagram here shows the previous uh, license. So there used to be a class uh, e and class D um, uh, that essentially got uh, uh, replaced by the farm gate and the farm gate plus um, retail scale. Uh, so the class D used to be, um, uh, there, there used to be geographic restrictions. So you couldn't sell outside of your regional districts. And these regional uh, restrictions were lifted uh, with the new farm gate license. Uh, where you can uh, you can slaughter one to twenty five animal unit, an animal unit being uh, defined as thousand as a thousand pound of live meat, um, and now you can sell uh, across BC. Um, and then there was a class B and class A that essentially got um, um, replaced by the abattoir license. So. Um, so it's clear that there's lots of interest throughout the province for the new license program. Um, those who were not interested in acquiring a license to slaughter on farm uh, listed uh, some reasons like lacking the skills and knowledge to slaughter on farm. 39% um, uh, said that they lacked the skills or the knowledge. 26% uh, mentioned that the cost of getting a license is too prohibitive. 
five percent were happy with the current their current slaughter arrangements, um, and thirty percent said that another reason was the cost. and and these reasons included uh, lack of time or physical ability, uh, too bu busy raising animals, not being equipped for it, um, being close to retirement, lack of economy of scale for producers, which is really big when you're very, very small scale, customer preference for fully inspected meat, currently building in a class A facility or um, licensing, not solving the cut and wrap issue and, um, and the inability to get insured on farm for on farm slaughter. Um, so the cut and wrap issue is something that we addressed, addressed in the survey. We're not going to be discussing this uh, too much in this presentation, uh, but once again, encouraging you to go look at the, at the full survey result report. Um, so the timing of slaughter need um, and the transportation uh, to slaughter or to processing um, has been a, a really big recurring issue uh, for, for producers. So um, we asked when producers needed to uh, get their animal processed. Um, and there's a lot of variation. You can see there's lots of variability here for regions. Uh, and there's lots of variability per, um, per species. So for example, if you look at broilers at the bottom, um, it's, you know, it's pretty even. The need is pretty even across the season, lots in the summer actually, um, uh, but a lot in all the other seasons. Um, if you look at cattle, it's a little bit more even as well. Uh, but you can see that the, the green part, which is the fall, um, is, is the larger chunk of um, when animals need to be processed um, in BC, um, especially for, for some smaller animals like the, the goats and the rabbits and the ducks. Um, and then we also ask how long the people dry, are driving their animals to slaughter. Um, and you can see that uh, uh, the majority are less than an hour or one to two hour. And this is the green, the darker green and the lighter green stripes. Um, but you can see that uh, some species have longer travel time, like ducks and rabbits, for example, um, that it's not uncommon to have travel times of over three hours or even more than five hours. Um, so this was expressed in the focus groups and the, the comment section as well. Um, that it's very hard in BC to find processing for rabbits and ducks. Um, and it's also hard to find processing for broilers, especially uh, on the smaller scale where it's hard to get just a few animals processed. You have to have a bigger batch. And then it, it brings up the issue of uh, the small scale producers producing just a little bit because they don't have quotas and so on and so forth. We'll offer you a little bit of a summary of our findings. Um, bring back the, the highlight poster here. Um, so essentially, one of the big take home message here is that the small scale meat producers run a very diversified, uh, run very diversified operation on many fronts. Um, they raise more than 15 types of different livestock. Um, they have different income levels and profitability, profitability levels. Um, we have producers who have been in business for over 30 years, and, and many others are just getting started. Some own land, some rent it, some have grazing tenure, some don't. Many maintain other farm enterprises. Um, another characteristic of the small-scale producers is, that, is the integration and stacking of systems and enterprises. Um, some drive their animals over five hours to get them slaughtered slaughtered and some drive only under an hour. Uh, some are very close to their customer base and others uh, are more remote and sparsely populated areas are further away. So in some ways, uh, but however, in some ways, this group is incredibly homogenous uh, across the regions and across all demographic, very high percentage of producers have jobs outside of their meat producing businesses. Um, that's 95%. Uh, BC-wide. Large amount of these um, 
uh, would like to take on meat production on on a on a full time basis. Um, uh, most, if not all, have outdoor and pasture based operation and use multiple beneficial land practices, as we saw earlier. Um, their challenges are consistent across the province. Uh, we heard loud and clear that access to slaughter, access to cut and wrap, and profitability are challenges that have created a market failure situation across the province. Um, this is characterized by many farms uh, starting to raid livestock for me than quitting the business in the short order or, or producers scaling back. We heard from many producers through this process that they would like to scale up their operations uh, and that the demand is there for the products, uh, but that they cannot meet it. Uh, many have stopped raising certain species because they could not get them processed. Um, we also heard from the previous producers, 89 operations that left the business in the past five years. Um, the challenges that they had were pretty much exactly the same as the current producers. Um, interestingly, when asked if those problems were resolved, if they would be interested in getting back to the business, 78% of the operators uh, that were not of retirement age said yes. So it's clear that we need more, that what we need is more farm, uh, more ranches, uh, not less, um, as we're headed towards food price inflation and more extreme weather events and ecological crisis. Uh, we need to preserve the diversity of our agricultural landscape. I'm going to highlight a few of our key recommendations, but these are just a few of the 20 or so that will be included in our final report. So I encourage you to read the report as well. In addition to general recommendations for the whole province in the main report, we're preparing reports for individual regions that will also include region-specific recommendations and opportunities. So I'm pretty excited about that. Last fall, the Ministry of Agriculture brought in exciting new legislation that expanded access to on-farm slaughter throughout the province through the new FarmGate license program. This was a great first step towards increasing local meat production and the Small Scale Meat Producers Association is well positioned to act in a supporting role, disseminating information about the program and helping to educate producers about the program. One of our recommendations that builds on this exciting new opportunity in a way that we hope will make this option even more feasible for producers is through the creation of a slaughter truck pilot program. It is clear from this survey that diversification of slaughter options across all regions is key to offering small scale producers a clear path to growing their businesses and meeting growing consumer demand for craft meat. The new FarmGate Plus license program currently allows farmers to develop a plan for safely slaughtering animals on their farms while requiring minimum infrastructure investment. Many producers expressed that they liked the idea of their animals not having to leave the farm to be slaughtered, but were not interested in slaughtering themselves. One of the most common suggestions we heard in the survey was to increase accessibility to mobile abattoirs. As we discuss in the survey, mobile abattoir units and pilot programs in BC have largely failed historically due to their regulatory framework and capital investment needs. But the new FarmGate Plus program now allows for on-farm slaughter with less capital investment and more simple infrastructure. We recommend the development and implementation of a one-year slaughter truck pilot program. A few slaughter trucks fitted to travel to farms and safely slaughter and transport carcasses to a refrigerated space should be designed, built, and allowed to operate for a year in a few selected regions. The goal of the program would be to develop best practices and to inform how best to move forward to implementing slaughter trucks across, across the province. What is a slaughter truck? Currently, a slaughter truck can offer on-farm slaughter and hauling services to farms who hold a FarmGate Plus license. These trucks come in different configurations depending on the type of livestock they process, their distance to a cooler, and what is available at the farm they serve, but they must all meet the FarmGate and FarmGate Plus code of practice. A slaughter truck unit that caters to FarmGate licenses can develop standard operating procedures that they can share with the farms that they serve. These SOPs would become part of the farm's food safety plan. Having the services of a professional slaughter person instead of having the farmer perform all tasks would greatly increase safety and confidence in the on-farm slaughter program. 
Currently in BC, there are several slaughter trucks in operation and they process a lot of meat for farmers' personal consumption. This concept has been proven and now it's time to adapt it to work with the FarmGate license program. Increasing access to slaughter is great, but we still have a bottleneck when it comes to getting the animal broken down into retail cuts for sale to consumers. One of the biggest obstacles facing the growth of this business is labor, so we have some recommendations around this issue specifically. We'd like to see an expansion of butchery education programs in British Columbia. We recommend working with existing butchery programs, such as the meat cutting program at Thompson Rivers University, to expand butchery training programs, especially craft and whole animal butchery, with the goal of increasing both general cut and wrap labor and the development of new businesses that raise the bar for butchering quality. We'd also like to include meat processing in the Agricultural Temporary Foreign Worker Program. We recommend that provincially rec regulated slaughter and cut and wrap facilities be classified under agriculture for the purposes of the Temporary Foreign Worker Program. Currently, this industry is considered, is considered manufacturing and as such may only employ up to 10% of its total employees as temporary foreign workers. Allowing small-scale meat processing facilities to fall under agriculture would greatly help to alleviate the labor strain the industry is hamstrung by. As the industry grows, we expect that we will see more interest in this industry from Canadian workers, but that is certainly not the case at this time. Moving forward, meat processing, particularly small-scale meat processing, will always be subject to seasonal fluctuations in demand. Being able to address the seasonality and corresponding labor problems through the temporary foreign worker program would go a long way to addressing this critical pain point. We couldn't make recommendations supporting the growth of the small-scale meat industry in BC without addressing the very serious problem of insurance. Finding affordable insurance for virtually all farms is becoming increasingly difficult, but we are finding that for some small scale meat producers, it is becoming impossible. We need to develop insurance options for on-farm slaughter. The market to ensure diversified farms is slim and almost completely non-existent for farms wanting to practice on-farm slaughter. Rates for insurable farms are so high as to render them uninsurable for all intents and purposes. Consequently, many producers are forced to decide between operating without insurance or not operating at all. As disaster recovery programs roll out across the province, we are seeing the fallout of this issue with many producers finding they are ineligible for recovery programs because their losses were technically insurable. Some small on-farm abattoirs have received notification from their insurance providers terminating their coverage without offering any alternative after obtaining a farm gate slaughter license. The Ministry of Agriculture developed these new regulations after four years of consideration with primary consideration being made for health and safety of our food system. It is unreasonable that a legal, safe part of our food system is uninsurable. Processing and selling it without insurance is undesirable for both producers and consumers. With farmland values increasing year over year, many producers are being forced into more remote regions. Suitable land for grazing may be found at an affordable price far from urban centers, but these properties are often off the grid. This poses another obstacle for producers to overcome as most insurers will not consider off-grid properties. The government of British Columbia should work in conjunction with industry stakeholders to develop insurance options for the province's meat producers. Currently, the cost of insurance, when it is available, is an impediment to the development of a robust regional meat industry. Insurance for on-farm abattoirs may, even, may be even more central to the success of this sector than the insurance for producers, which still seems to be available, although still prohibitively expensive. We have lots more recommendations, and I hope that you will take the time to read them in the report, which will be available on our website very soon. If you would like to be notified when it is online, please sign up for our mailing list by joining either with a free supporter membership or as a producer for $35 on our website at smallscalemeat.ca.